Welcome to the Healthcare Ethics and Law Podcast with me, Kira O'Brien. So welcome back to this talk on the four principles of biomedical ethics. This is the second webinar or lecture of our series on dental ethics. The first was looking at an introduction to dental ethics and the main ethical frameworks that we use within the field. But today we're going to look at probably one of the most well-known ethical frameworks, the four principles of biomedical ethics, as put forward by Beauchamp and Childress. And we're going to look at how these relate to dentistry and ethics. We're going to look at the four principles individually, but first we're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of this model and why we use it. And then we're going to give uh, you an understanding of some wider themes, such as looking at public health, healthcare nudges, and, and also negligence, and look at how these relate to the four principles themselves. So we're going to be looking at GDC outcomes A and D. And last time we were very much looking in the domain of ethics in this Venn diagram, uh, but as we go through this series, we're going to push through into that intersection of ethics and law. And today we're going to bring in a little bit more legal aspect of, of things and, and really relate the ethical frameworks and ethical concepts that we've been looking at to more uh, real-life examples. And so as I said last time, we looked at these three ethical frameworks, uh, but today we're concentrating firmly on the four principles of biomedical ethics put forward by Beauchamp and Childress. And so the four principles, as most of you, I'm sure, have come across at some point in your, in your careers or during your education. Uh, we're looking at autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and, and justice in the context of healthcare. So firstly, I want to just step back and look at the, a couple of advantages and disadvantages of this model before we address each one one by one and have a look at uh, what, they're, what they are about and some related concepts. So firstly, what's the main advantage of this model? Well, it's easy to use. There's four principles, they're easy to, to apply, and in most cases when we've got an ethical situation or scenario, one of these principles will apply. But it's not without its drawbacks. And the main one, in my opinion, is, is what do we do when values conflict? And this can often happen, we saw last time a conflict between autonomy and healthcare justice when we were looking at water fluoridation, but another well-known example is you can at euthanasia, uh, or end-of-life care. Um, imagine, let's say, you've got a patient who's at the end of life uh, and they want to um, undergo euthanasia because, uh, they're, let's say, they're in a great deal of distress and pain. On one hand, we've got doing good because it's the patient's wishes and it would get them out of this pain that they're experiencing. But on the other hand, it would do harm because, you know, essentially we're helping them to die, which is against a lot of our ethical principles within medical uh, ethics. Another disadvantage of this model is that it's too simplistic. So a lot of individuals say that, you know, we've just got four principles and how are we supposed to apply this to all the examples that we see in practice, you know, a lot, a lot of the time they're too complex, the situations we find ourselves in, and it just doesn't give us enough. Um, and to a degree, I understand that criticism, um, it's one that I held, but, you know, on reflection, I think perhaps it's selling a little bit short, and, and I think one reason for this criticism is that generally when we look at these four principles, we look at them in a very narrow lens, and what I really want to do throughout this presentation is introduce some related ethical concepts and also look at the applications of these principles. So we're not just looking at four principles, we're looking at a whole host of things here, as we can see, from informed consent to healthcare inequalities um, to, to things such as negligence. So I really want to give you a flavour of all these different themes and, and just look a bit more of the nuances at, at the four principles that perhaps you may not have considered before or, or may, you, that you may be aware of. Firstly, we're just going to address autonomy, the, f the first principle and, and potentially the most important to many. So autonomy literally means self-rule. And when we look at what, what is autonomy, it relates to a lot of these terms which we've got here. So it's freedom to make your own choices. Uh, it's, it's being um, uh, free from any influence from, 
from outside sources, it's your own decision, so you're free from manipulation, coercion, and deceit. And it's it's becoming an, a certain type of person with your own desires, preferences, and choices. Um, and so it's very much personal thing, autonomy. And Feinberg, he uh, reflects this in his definition of autonomy, uh, referring to it as self-rule, and Kant refers to it as self-legislation. The philosopher Gerald Dworkin, he looks at autonomy from a more functional perspective. Um, so it's actually a capacity that we possess, a second-order ability to reflect on for first-order desires. So, for example, I may have a, a first-order desire to eat some cake. I may be at a cafe and think, oh, I'd like to eat that. It looks, it looks delicious. But then I might reflect on that using this higher-order capacity of reflection and think, well, actually, it does look delicious, but I'm on a diet at the moment. I'm trying to lose a bit of weight and cut back a little bit. So upon reflection of this uh, this desire, I'm going to decide not to eat this cake. So we can think of autonomy as this capacity to reflect on things and, and put our own preferences and desires into this process of deciding what we're going to do. And Joseph Raz, another philosopher, who says that, again, autonomy is a capacity to 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 have our exercise our own choices free of outside influences such as coercion from other individuals so if we're thinking of the context of, of dentistry it, it would be the ability to make a decision free of influence from for example a dentist trying to force you to have one treatment over another so that would be the the opposite of, of autonomy and paternalism And so, as we know, autonomy, it's a real foundation or cornerstone of medical and dental ethics. Over the last 50 years, it's really predominated the, the discussion and the field and, and the concept of informed consent, which we're going to look at in the next lecture, really predominates. Uh, as opposed to paternalism, which in the past there was a more paternalistic relationship between the doctor and the patient, in which the doctor would almost tell the patient what treatment they were going to have and what medication to take, there was really little discussion. Whereas when we think about our modern day relationship with our patients, we have a more a partnership approach where discussing the, the pros and cons, risks and benefits, the different treatment alternatives and so on. And so it really puts the uh, decision in the patient's hands and allows them to make the decision for themselves. Um, and I just wanted to look about what, what is paternalism really? What are we talking about when we look at this term? Because it often um, has a sort of, it's almost become a bit of a dirty word in medical ethics, but but it is a little bit more complicated than perhaps we, we, we realise on first glance. And so if someone acts paternalistically to someone else by interfering with their autonomy or liberty, doing this without their consent and doing so because they think it will help or benefit that individual. And so an example of this is uh, being compelled to wear a seatbelt. So it may be against your will to wear a seatbelt, but it's required by law, uh, even if it's against your own choice. And the reason is to protect you and to protect others in the event of a road traffic accident. And so in ethics, this relates to and derives from what's called the harm principle. Uh, paternalism um, is the interference of state or an individual motivated by a claim that it will bring about some benefit or protect an individual from harm. And this was put forward by John Stuart Mill, who we discussed last time in the context of utilitarianism in uh, his, his work on liberty, which is a brilliant piece of philosophy if you're looking to uh, read something interesting about uh, autonomy and freedom of speech. It's very accessible and highly recommended if you're, if you're looking to, to read something within the field. I, I'd highly recommend that and, and it's definitely worth, worth a read. And so now I just want to look at beneficence and non-maleficence together. They're often compared and contrasted to one another. So beneficence usually is considered as the state of producing or doing good, whereas on the other hand, non-maleficence is uh, an obligation or duty not to harm others, or rather to refrain from harming others. And so we're going to look at the difference between the two, but I first want to introduce a thought experiment to try and help us understand the difference, and we're then going to unpick that and look at what the aspects of it are. So I'll introduce the thought experiment and then I've got a quick question and discussion at the end of it for us to, to get into. So let's imagine we've got pers person A 
they're walking by a lake and they see an individual drowning. Uh, they know that they can help save this individual as they're a competent swimmer, but they choose to simply stand by and watch as the individual drowns, and they don't even call for help, nor alert other passers-by to what's going on. And then we've got the second situation where we've got person B who's walking past a lake and they notice someone standing close by. And they know this individual can't swim, but they choose to push them in, knowing that it would lead to their death and they would drown. So person A just stands by whilst the individual drowns and person B has a more active role in, in pushing them in. And so my question is, do you think the person of action, uh, the actions of person B are worse than person A? And what are the relevant differences? Why do you think that is? If you do, or do you think they're both equally culpable uh, to this individual drowning? And so what we're really looking at is, is a distinction between maleficence, beneficence and non-maleficence, and also what's called as positive and negative duties, uh, and sometimes known as an act or omissions distinction, which some of you may have heard of before. So let's have a look at positive duties first. They're positive duties because they require a positive action, so we have to actually do something. Um, so if we look at the example where the individual is drowning, we have a positive ethical obligation to help that person as opposed to standing by. So we should try and you know, jump in and save them, alert someone to, to help them, but we have to do something. We have to take a positive action or positive step to um, influence this decision to help that person. And so that really relates to beneficence. And for example, in dentistry, we've got a positive duty to treat disease when we identify it, uh, and failures to do so would be negligent. For example, imagine we've got a patient that attends in pain, We've got a positive duty to help resolve this. You know, we need to take some diagnostic tests and come up with a treatment plan um, if we can. Um, so again, we have to take a, a positive step and an action to help that individual. Whereas in contrast, negative duties require us to refrain from an action or what's sometimes known as an omission. And so when we've got the individual by the lake, we've got, a, posit we've got a, a negative duty not to push them in. So we have to refrain from that action. That action is considered ethically wrong in this, in this situation. So, so really, the difference between the positive duty requires a positive action, whereas a negative duty requires us to refrain from doing harm to someone. An example of this in dentistry um, is uh, a case... Uh, with, uh, from 1996 of Appleton v Garrett, in which a dentist was um, over-treating patients without their consent um, for the purposes of financial gain. So, for example, they're doing extensive uh, crown and bridge work, or fillings on teeth that didn't need it, and all for the purpose of, of money. And the patients in this case said, well, we didn't even know what was going on. We thought we just came for a checkup, and we left with all this treatment and having to pay for it. And so we've got a negative duty to refrain from doing these kinds of things and refrain from doing harm, such as over-treatment, to patients. And so this really relates to the duty of non-maleficence. So on one hand, we've got positive duties, positive action and beneficence. And on the other hand, we've got negative duties where we refrain from harmful actions, and that's non-maleficence. And so we're finally going to look at healthcare justice. Um, justice is a, a huge philosophical, ethical concept, but we're going to just focus on healthcare justice, which looks at the fair, just, and equal distribution and allocation of resources. Uh, as we know, that's quite a topical issue, especially as we've been through a period of austerity and now with COVID, there's a high chance that we're not going to have as much resources as perhaps we would like or we need for our population. So we're going to have to think about how we can use these scarce resources and allocate them in a way which is best for our population. And there's a few ways we can consider how we're going to do that. Uh, and we're going to look at just three main principles. Uh, firstly, we can think of it as distributing in terms of need. So who needs these resources the most? Are there people with pre-existing health conditions, for example, or people at higher risk of developing conditions? Do they need more help and resources allocated to them? The second principle we're going to look at is called the maximising principle. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximise good uh, with the resources we've got. And so that takes a, a utilitarian approach to maximise welfare, to maximise good using the resources that we have available to us. And finally, we've got the egalitarian approach, which tries to provide equal 
access uh, and health to everyone, um, regardless of who they are. Uh, and finally, in most cases, we, we tend to take a combination approach. So we may allocate 50% of the resources to those in need, and then the rest uh, we're going to use to maximize. So it can be more than one approach, but these are just some, some introductory uh, methods that we might think about using for distributing resources. And despite our best efforts of, of resource distribution, we know that healthcare inequalities still exist uh, within healthcare and within dentistry. Those from less well-off backgrounds, um, the evidence shows that they're more likely to have a higher DMFT score. Uh, and this really relates to what we call social determinants of health. So, um, if, you know, social, someone's social background can affect their health, and the research shows that, that that's certainly something that does happen. So brilliant. So just to conclude, you know, we've looked through the four principles of biomedical ethics and we can see they're quite complex in nature and, and they really relate to numerous related concepts such as public health, negligence. We've also looked at those healthcare nudges. So I've tried to, to look at some more uh, nuanced and, uh, and, and perhaps uh, uh, often missed uh, aspects of these four principles. And so... I hope, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that it's um, given you a little bit of insight in a variety of topics. If you want to go back and check out the previous lecture, as I said, it is on our website, on your YouTube channel. There's plenty more information on our website, healthcareethicsandlaw.co.uk. Uh, there's loads of information on dental ethics and lots of resources on there and, and more about the legal aspects as well, which you may be interested in checking out. Uh, we've also got our podcasts, which are on Spotify and, and other podcast providers. So there's loads of information for you to access. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you hopefully at the next talk, which we're going to be looking a bit more at consent and capacity. And as I said, we're bringing in more legal concepts uh, and looking at how the ethical concepts relate to that as well. So looking forward to that one and hopefully we'll see you there. And thanks again for uh, listening and I hope it was uh, very interesting and we'll see you soon.